Jean-Pierre Gattuso, Nathalie Hilmi, Philip Williamson, and all of our guests, welcome. My name is Luisa Sarmiento, and it's my privilege to welcome you here. Today, we'll be discussing the main outcomes of the special report on the ocean and cryospheres in a changing climate. Thank you all for coming. The virtual blue copper drive is a recent initiative to offer a virtual pass to the COP25. It's inspired by the COP, which is a supreme decision-making body for climate change international agreements. This upcoming December, the COP will be in Chile, and it will focus its attention on the world's most vulnerable ecosystems, the oceans. But why virtual? Well, mainly because not everyone can or should attend international meetings, given the massive CO2 emissions associated with paddling. However, all of you should be able to participate in decisional meetings such as the COP25 in Chile. Today, our main partner is the Ocean University Initiative. This initiative has been launched by the University of Brest, with the aim of establishing in France a United Nations University dedicated to science and policy in ocean and coast related matters. Today, together, we will be discussing the true states of the oceans and the cryosphere. But first, what is the IPCC and what are those reports? Well, created in 1988 by the United Nations, the IPCC, which stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, provides the science basis of climate change and options for adaptations and mitigation. The IPCC assessments are a key input for the international negotiations to tackle climate change. Two days ago, in Monaco, for the first time in history, a special report on the ocean and cryospheres in a changing climate was released by the IPCC. This means that for the first time in history, a complete report reveals vital information about the effects of climate change on oceans, coast, polar, mountain ecosystems, and the human communities that depend on them. Today, we have the honor to have with, uh, to have with us three lead authors of this 2019 special report. So you will be able to, you should be seeing them here. Here we have Phil Williamson, Nathalie Hindley, Jean-Pierre Gattuso. Let me present them to you. Dr. Jean-Pierre Gattuso is a biological oceanographer. He's a senior research professor at the Sorbonne University and associate scientist at the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations. He specializes in the effects of climate change on marine ecosystems and the services they provide to society. Joining us from France, he was a coordinating lead author in Chapter 1, Framing and Context. Dr. Nathalie Hilmi is an economist. She's an expert in macroeconomics and international finance. She's a member of several international associations and specializes in the economies of ocean acidification. Joining us from Monaco, she was the lead author in chapter five, Changing Ocean, Marine Ecosystems and Dependent Communities. Dr. Philip Williamson is a biochemist. He is working for the UK Natural Environmental Research Council. He has been involved in the planning and implementation of research programs on ocean atmospheres interactions, marine productivity, and microbial biodiversity. Joining us from the UK, he was also a lead author in Chapter 5. So this is a virtual session that we are doing for initiatives as Future Earth. So please be aware that during this discussion, you can submit any questions through www.slide.do, entering the event code BBCOP25. You can also find this information below in the description. Now, I will kindly ask you to give your full attention to our speakers as they will present the report.
Hello, everyone. Um, very happy to be with you uh, to uh, provide this information on the SROC, the special report on the ocean and cryosphere in the changing climate. And as you can see, the front and the back cover of the report pays uh, tribute to the various regions addressed in this assessment, from the poles to the tropics. Uh, the ocean and cryosphere, the frozen parts of our planet, might feel remote to, to some people, but actually they impact all of us for weather and climate, for food and water, for energy, trade and, and transport, health and well-being, and also for culture and identity. Therefore, the ocean and the cryosphere are critical for all life on Earth. And this report has shown that if greenhouse gas emissions uh, continue to increase, However, if we reduce emissions sharply, consequences for people and their livelihoods uh, will be still challenged. Uh, but they will be potentially more manageable for those who are uh, uh, most uh, vulnerable. The report uh, reveals uh, the, the numerous benefits of uh, ambitious and effective climate adaptation for sustainable uh, development. Conversely, there may be also escalating costs and risks associated with delayed action. On the next slide, uh, uh, you see that uh, some numbers, uh, SROC in numbers. The launch of the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate is the conclusion of two years of hard work. The commissioning of this report responds to government proposals including from uh, the Principality of Monaco, which, which uh, ger generously hosted uh, the scoping meeting as well as uh, the approval uh, session. And uh, this report builds on the completion of the special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees and also builds on the special report on climate change and land. Together, these uh, three special reports uh, mark uh, the most intensive and ambitious period in the IPCC's 30-year uh, history. Uh, those three reports have been published in less than one year. And they build a strong foundation for the upcoming IPCC sixth assessment report and as well as for the, the synthesis report that will come afterwards. So this latest report, uh, SROC, uh, was written by 104 authors from uh, 36 countries, including authors from 19 developing countries or countries with economies in transition. 31% of the authors are women, and almost 7,000 scientific publications were referenced uh, and assessed in the report which received more than 31,000 expert and government review comments to which we had to provide a reply. So this uh, figure shows uh, really uh, what uh, components of the climate systems uh, system was uh, were um, assessed in this in this report. Uh, it shows uh, the cryosphere on the left and on the right on top uh, and the ocean uh, on the bottom. It also shows uh, the many links uh, uh, between uh, the cryosphere and the ocean, uh, which exchange uh, carbon dioxide, water, and heat. Um, and uh, as you can see at the bottom, we will be discussing in this uh, presentation, uh, marine heat waves, uh, sea level rise, uh, ocean heat uh, content, uh, its uptake, uh, changes in uh, ocean pH, and also changes in uh, in oxygen. So now I will uh, let, give the floor to my uh, colleague Nathalie Hilmi. This report is unique be because of the first time the IPCC has produced an in-depth report examining the farthest corners of the Earth from the highest mountains and remote polar regions to the deepest oceans. We have found that even, uh, and especially in these places, human-caused climate change is evident. 
This report documents the melting of high mountain glaciers and polar ice sheets, which contain the fresh water for our future. It documents the thawing of permafrost, which is the frozen foundation for communities and wildlife habitats of the north. It shines a light on coastal and low-lying areas where sea level rise and associated impacts threaten the lives and livelihoods of a large segment of the population. And it documents the ways in which, for decades, the ocean has been acting like a sponge, absorbing carbon dioxide and heat to regulate the global temperature. But it can't keep up. Taken together, these changes show that the world's ocean and cryosphere have been taking the heat for climate change for decades. The consequences for nature and humanity are sweeping and severe. This report highlights the urgency of timely, ambitious, coordinated and enduring action. What's at stake? is the health of ecosystems, wildlife, and importantly, the world we leave our children. Even though uh, many of you, I mean, this is a virtual blue cup, but uh, we thought that it was also uh, interesting to provide uh, information on uh, the mount high mountain areas uh, covered in the report, uh, because there is an, an obvious link with what's happening in the ocean. Uh, melting glaciers, uh, snow and ice in mountain regions are uh, visible, very visible symbols of uh, climate change. A total of uh, 670 million people live in high mountain regions, and these people are increasingly exposed to hazards and changed changes in the water availability. Glaciers, snow, ice and permafrost are declining and will continue to do so. Smaller glaciers formed, for example, in Europe, Eastern Africa, the tropical Andes and Indonesia are projected to lose more than 80% of their current ice mass by 2100 if emissions continue to increase, increase strongly. As glaciers retreat and snow cover shrinks, warm water, or one, excuse me, warm, uh, warm adapted uh, plant and animal species migrate upslope. These changes, uh, species richness, uh, in the way that uh, warm adapted species increase, uh, cold and snow adapted species decrease and risk eventual ex extinctions especially through uh, without conservation measures. The retreat of uh, high mountain cryosphere will continue to adversely affect regressional activities, uh, tourism and uh, cultural assets. Um, and uh, what is more, uh, on the next uh, slide, The retreat of uh, glaciers and thawing permafrost increase hazards for people living in those uh, regions. For example, through landslides, snow avalanches and floods. Changes in water availability for households, agriculture and energy will not just affect people in these high mountain regions, but also communities much further downstream and eventually to the coast. Uh, limiting warming would help people to adjust to those changes in water supplies and limit risks uh, related to mountain hazards. And integrated uh, water management and transboundary cooperation provide opportunities to address those impacts, uh, the impacts of those changes in uh, water resources. So now we are going to move uh, from high mountains to polar areas. No, the changes in the polar regions don't just affect penguins and polar bears. They also affect influence people's lives all around the world, wherever we live. We can have the next slide, thank you. The big headline story is that the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica are melting and they're releasing hundreds of thousands of tons of water into the ocean every year. 
measure those in gigatons, that's a thousand million tons. Because the ice sheets will continue to melt in response to past and current warming, the planet will experience global sea level rise for decades to centuries to come. It will be very difficult to stop. Now, the Arctic sea ice is floating on the sea. When that melts, it doesn't increase the sea level rise. The Arctic sea ice helps to keep us cool by reflecting heat to space. That's declined up until now in every month of the year, and that rate of loss is increasing. The ice is getting thinner. The observed loss of sea ice in recent years is faster than we expected from the climate models. Now, if we're able to limit global warming to around one and a half degrees, then we should still be able to keep some of that ice in the Arctic all through the year. But if it goes any warmer than that, then we'll lose it. Now, ice on land is called permafrost, it's frozen soil. When that thaws, the whole uh, habitat changes. That also releases greenhouse gases, particularly methane, to the atmosphere. Now, if the warming continues, uh, we're going to lose uh, at least a quarter of that near surface permafrost uh, if we limit warming to one and a half degrees. But if high emissions continue, we lose more than half of it, maybe around 70%. And that will affect all the people living in the Arctic region. Uh, and that's uh, the Arctic peoples, of which there are several million, are already changing their activities in response to the changes that have occurred. Their future success depends in adapting to the future changes and having wider societal support by having the international uh, collaboration, by having funding capacities and having changes in, in international coordination. Next slide. Next slide. The water from the melting glaciers uh, and the ice sheets are going into the ocean. Uh, and that's where the main effects are going to be felt. Up until now, we've had a global sea level rise of about 15 centimeters. Now this increase is currently rising more than twice as fast as 20 or 30 years ago and the pace will further accelerate reaching up to 1.1 meters or maybe more by the year 2100 if emissions continue to increase and remain high now the sea level rise will increase the frequency of extreme sea level events which occur during high tides and intense storms in very many low-lying cities and small islands will be exposed to the risks of flooding and the land loss uh, in, within the next 20 or 30 years. Without the major investments in adaptation, those people will be at very great risk. But they can do something about it. Build a sea wall, have physical protection. That's rather expensive, probably limited to the main cities and areas of, of highest human population. We can also keep and conserve the coastal vegetation around the coast. In tropical regions, it's mangrove forests. In temperate regions, it's salt marshes or seagrass beds. To maintain the coastal vegetation, that helps to protect against sea level rise. Also, if you've got a lot of money, you can try land reclamation, actually building your land out to sea. That's been done in the Netherlands, it's done in Monaco, but it isn't really a serious solution to the problem for most of the world. And if worse comes to the worst, then managed retreat and relocation is really the only alternative. But is that an alternative for small island states if they don't have anywhere else to go to? Now for the ocean itself, uh, very many changes, which the main one, of course, is the increase of temperature. And that's because it's increased, it's taken up more than 80% of the extra heat from global warming and it's raised the temperature from the sea surface to the sea floor. It's not just a temperature change. The warming affects the mixing, the stratification of the surface layers, and that decreases the supply of oxygen and nutrients for marine life. Now, as a result of the temperature effect, we're having marine heat waves in the surface waters, but the surface waters are also most exposed to the increase of carbon dioxide. Their chemistry is changing, by taking the extra carbon dioxide, ocean acidity is increases. And that has most effect on organisms that have built shells out of calcium carbonate, particularly corals. Next slide. 
The warming causes shifts in fish populations. Those in the northern hemisphere generally move towards the North Pole. Those in the southern hemisphere populations move to the south southwards to the South Pole. That reduces the global catch potential, and particularly the decreases are in the tropical tropical regions. Now these effects uh, will have impacts on the coastal communities that depend on seafood. We also have for the world as a whole that seafood will become possibly more expensive uh, and more valuable. Uh, but people who depend on it for their diet will have less of it available. Now, if we can reduce pollution and overfishing, that will help the populations of fish. We will be able to take more out as fish catches. But at present, the populations are suffering from these other effects, these other stresses. And we need to do something about those as well. I've mostly been talking about the global scale. In this slide, that's maybe a little bit difficult to read. It breaks it down into regions. At the top of the slide, we have Arctic, we have North Atlantic, all the different parts of the world that show the evidence of where these changes are occurring. Now, the colours that are in yellow and, and a grey colour, that indicates whether the, the physics of the ocean, the chemistry of the ocean, how that is changing, whether it's increasing or decreasing for a particular quantity or parameter. Temperature, oxygen, ocean pH, that's the acidification, sea ice extent or sea level. Now those changes in the physics and the chemistry, we have confidence in them if there's several black dots there. We don't have much, we're not quite sure what's going on and there's only a single black dot there. But the most important effects are those further down where we've got the pinks and the blue colours. The pink shows where there is a negative effect on a marine ecosystem. And there's a list of those on the left hand side. Whether we're dealing with the upper water column, corals, coastal wetlands, kelp forests, rocky shores, deep sea or the polar benthos, or the sea ice associated ecosystems. Not all of those we have data for, so not all of the boxes are filled in. But you'll see most of the boxes are pink in colour, showing its harmful, damaging, negative effects. At the bottom of this chart, we have the human impacts, the ecosystem services that are provided by nature, the benefits provided by nature. Again, we have the same colour coding, that the pink is bad news, the blue is possibly benefits. On the whole, the bad news overweighs is much greater than the benefits. Again, that the confidence is shown by the black dots. If there's only one black dot, it, it's only the low confidence of two black dots, medium confidence, three black dots, high confidence. We're not absolutely sure that all these changes are, are as, as, as extreme as shown at the moment, but we're gathering extra information and improving the models all the time based on these observations. Next slide. What we see is that human-induced climate change has a major footprint on the system that we depend upon, from the top of the mountains to the depth of the ocean. These changes will continue for generations to come. This uh, new IPCC special report highlights the urgency of prioritizing timely, ambitious and coordinated action to address widespread and enduring changes in the ocean and cryosphere. It provides the best available scientific knowledge to empower people, communities and governments to tackle the unprecedented transitions in all aspects of society, including energy, land and ecosystems, urban and infrastructure, as well as industry, that will be needed to deliver on the Paris Agreement. The report gives evidence of the benefits of combining scientific with local and indigenous knowledge to develop suitable options to manage climate change risks and enhance resilience. This is the first IPCC report that highlights the importance of education to enhance climate change, ocean and cryosphere literacy. The more decisively and earlier we act, the more able we will be to address unavoidable changes, 
manage risks, improve our lives, and achieve sustainability for ecosystems and people around the world today and in the future. This report also uh, provide, uh, in, has assessed uh, a few potential measures uh, uh, or options to uh, perform uh, mitigation and uh, adaptation. Uh, on this figure, you see uh, three main uh, groups of uh, response uh, options. Uh, the first one on the left is about addressing the causes of climate change, and uh, several of those uh, were uh, uh, assessed in the report, and these are the small numbers you see on the left-hand side of each bullet. For example, renewable energy is covered in uh, chapters 1 and 5, uh, reduced atmospheric pollution in chapter 2, etc. The second group of uh, indicated on the top uh, of, the, of the graph, uh, and this is about supporting biological and ecological adaptation also fully covered in several chapters, as you can see, of uh, the report. And finally, the third group is about enhancing uh, societal adaptation, which, as you see, also is covered in many, many chapters. There is another group of uh, actions that have not been uh, assessed in this report, and these are about uh, solar radiation management, uh, which can be performed also in the ocean and perhaps uh, on the cryosphere. But uh, it was not uh, within uh, the scoping document uh, that uh, authors received, so it was not assessed, because it will be assessed fully in uh, an upcoming report of the IPCC due to be published in 2021 or 2022. Uh, by the, that will be the report of Working Group 3 of uh, the IPCC. So if you want to move to the next slide. So uh, we wanted uh, my colleagues, uh, Natalie, uh, Phil and myself to mention that this presentation is based on slides shown at the launch of the SROC report, uh, which took place in Monaco uh, two days ago or yeah, two days ago. Uh, so we are very grateful to the IPCC Working Group 2 Technical Support Unit, to the IPCC co-chairs and all other authors for presentation development. If you want to download the report, uh, everything is uh, fully available at this uh, URL that you see here. The full report, all the figures, the summary for policymakers, uh, the, uh, the glossary, uh, the reviewers, uh, um, the review editors' uh, assessment, uh, etc. And then you have all the, the social networks' uh, means to uh, connect uh, to the IPCC. Thank you very much. So now that we have uh, listened to this uh, great presentation, we're inviting all of you out there to um, go and type your questions on Slido. Um, you just need to put VBCOP25 has the event code. So um, for the first question we have um, is, how is this report planned to be addressed at the COP25 in Chile? Is there any direct link between the IPCC and the COP25? Well, I can start uh, replying to your question, uh, Louisa. Yes, uh, there is a, an informal link between the two, of course. Uh, the IPCC is here to provide uh, the United Nations framework on climate change with uh, scientific assessment uh, so that uh, governments can uh, make decisions uh, on sound basis. Uh, and there will be several side events uh, uh, at the uh, next COP. The conference of the parties of this uh, framework on climate change, which will take place uh, COP25 in uh, Chile in December. Uh, some side events will be hosted by uh, the IPCC, which will highlight uh, the three special reports uh, published uh, uh, in this past year. And uh, there will be also many other side events uh, organized by uh, various countries, NGOs, etc which will cover in, in a big way uh, the ocean and, and uh, yeah. maybe Phil would like to. 
Okay. Just to uh, agree with that comment and that some of us will be there, although feeling rather guilty about our carbon footprints, but it's, it is a way of getting the message across to the formal delegates and, the, uh, and, and other participants at the meeting. Nathalie, do you have uh, comments on that? All right, so then let's jump to the next question. Um, we are asking now about the carbon sequestration. It is discussed that ocean could have more potential for carbon sequestration. How could that feature be enhanced? I'll start by answering that. And we do consider that in the report, but we're not all that optimistic about it. There's, there are a range of methods uh, for increasing the amount of carbon taken up, but those that are most uh, sort of easily managed are in the coastal regions, the coastal vegetation, sometimes called natural solutions, blue carbon. Uh, we've done the calculations and uh, it doesn't seem as though the, the amount of extra carbon taken up will be that great on the global scale. Now, for some small countries, it might be relatively important. And the main value of these coastal habitats is actually conservation and keeping the carbon that they've got uh, in good state and doing conservation, preservation, keeping those habitats intact. Now, there are other ways of, of adding extra carbon to the ocean by fertilizing the, the uh, wide open blue ocean uh, uh, away from land, but the, particularly in the southern ocean. But there's all sorts of governance issues, there's all sorts of scientific questions which make that uh, a rather uncertain and probably uh, an unhelpful way to go. Whether Jean-Pierre would like to comment any further? No, that's the comprehensive reply. And uh, especially talking about those uh, coastal regions, does the report assess in any way which regions are the most vulnerable or which regions need the most help in the upcoming years? I think you know, most in vulnerable communities are those in uh, living in the small island developing states. Uh, about uh, 65 million people live in those countries and they are very dependent for the, their livelihood and uh, revenue and uh, their well-being from of the ocean. They depend on the ocean, so this is. I think they are the most vulnerable. To make a connection with a question from uh, Isabel Rudas, um, she's asking what would be an example of local or indigenous knowledge we can use uh, in fighting the effects of climate change? Well, uh, none of us is really an expert on this issue, but... Uh, I, I can respond. Uh, in French Polynesia, for example, they have some uh, uh, fisheries management that are very useful for uh, um, to, to, to adapt to the effects of climate change. And uh, those, those knowledge are local and uh, indigenous. All right, thank you for that. And um, we have another important question uh, from Isabel Rudas. She's asking, the IPCC has many reports. Is it the most urgent yet? Do you feel that the policy makers are listening to you? Because it feels like the emissions are keep rising and keep rising, but nothing is done. So uh, what would you comment on that? I can start uh, on this. Uh, what? Um very often people ask the question, what is the usefulness of IPCC reports? Um, and I like to uh, mention the fact that uh, it is uh, the report, I mean, the full assessment that was, which was published in uh, the fifth assessment report that was published in uh, 2013 and 2014, which informed the COP21, uh, the, the COP at which uh, the Paris Agreement was designed and agreed upon. The Paris Agreement was built on this assessment of the sea and the fact that uh, 
this agreement mentions uh, the objective to uh, limit uh, the global warming uh, to less than two degrees uh, compared to pre-industrial and uh, getting as close as possible to 1.5 degree. That is in direct relation to uh, the uh, IPCC AR5 uh, report. So this is an example of how uh, IPCC reports are, are useful. And uh, we hope uh, that the series of the three reports, the special reports published uh, in the past year, will provide enough knowledge uh, to policymakers in uh, December. And importantly, the next COP, uh, next year in uh, COP26, uh, which will take place in London. And this is in 2020, that's the place where, uh, as designed by the Paris Agreement five years later, the countries will be asked to enhance their ambition, their nationally determined contributions in 2020. So the, so the goal of those three the, the information they need to enhance their ambition in the next uh, COP meetings. I will agree with Jean-Pierre on almost everything, except that the, the next uh, UNFCCC meeting, I believe, is in Glasgow in Scotland rather than in London. But everyone's welcome there. Uh, Scotland may be an independent country by then. I don't know, but uh, that, those are the plans. Perfect. Thank you for that comment. Uh, we have many questions coming up. So Dwight Owens is asking, um, how does this report intersect with sustainable development goal number 15, life under water? Uh, so maybe for those who don't know out there, um, the sustainable development goals are uh, 17 goals that have been set to develop a more sustainable world. world. And number 13, which is the question, is life under water. I can Maybe try to reply. No. Uh, the sustainable development goals, in fact, are all linked uh, with each other. They are not separate. But uh, the, the sustainable goal 14 is more devoted to life underwater, as you know. And uh, for example, fisheries. If uh, fisheries is impacted by climate change, this will impact also the food security of some people their uh, health, uh, their uh, nutrition. So this, you can see how sustainable development goals can be impacted by climate change because uh, climate change will impact the, the fish and the fisheries and those fisheries will impact other climate change and uh, the, uh, development, other sustainable development goals. In fact, what we are looking for is uh, for climate resilient development pathways that will make all those development sustainable development possible and realizable yes good um do we have any more comments on this i will make one more comment it happens that the the three scientists that you have on screen have all had links with ocean acidification in one way or another and within sustainable development goal 14 i believe there are some particular paragraphs about ocean acidification it, it's not saying that it has to stop but it says that countries will make the efforts to, to measure it to monitor it and do their very best to uh, to keep it under control um perhaps we could um uh, take this opportunity and just go back quickly on ocean acidification and just quickly, could you uh, tell us again what it is and really um, the impacts? Because it seems to be a big component of this report. Okay. Um, so ocean acidification is a very simple process by which uh, the ocean has absorbed uh, 20 to 30 percent of uh, the CO2 emitted uh, by humans uh, in the atmosphere. Therefore, providing a service uh, because we have, uh, if we didn't have an ocean, we would have uh, much more uh, CO2 in the atmosphere uh, and therefore uh, more intense changes in climate. But this uh, CO2 uptake is detrimental to the ocean uh, because uh, CO2 is, uh, is an acid gas uh, that uh, which com when CO2 combines with seawater, it provides a, a weak acid, increasing uh, the acidity 
of uh, seawater. Uh, the acidity of seawater has increased by uh, 30% uh, since uh, 1850, and it is uh, projected that it will increase uh, maybe double or triple uh, in uh, 2100. Uh, this increase in ocean acidity is a concern for several uh, aspects of marine life. Uh, one of them, uh, perhaps the most uh, prominent, is uh, calcification, that is the building cells and skeletons by corals, by mollusks, uh, you know, mussels, uh, oysters, uh, because uh, mussels and oysters and corals, they need uh, a brick uh, to build their shells and skeleton, and this brick is uh, carbonate, carbonate ions. Um, and when the seawater acidity increases, this brick becomes in limited supply, making, making it more difficult for uh, plants and animals to build uh, shells, uh, skeleton, and calcium carbonate. for the building of shells and skeleton, but it's more uh, that uh, the, uh, uh, in, uh, in the next decades, uh, many areas, uh, in, the in many areas in the, in the surface ocean, uh, not only it will be more difficult for plants and animals to build uh, uh, calcium carbonate, but the calcium carbonate, which has been precipitated before, will be uh, corroded. The water will, be cor will become corrosive for certain shells and skeletons made of uh, aragonite, a special kind of, uh, of uh, calcium carbonate. There are many other uh, impacts, implications of uh, ocean acidification on fish behavior, on uh, uh, Yes, uh, fish, uh, the behavior of fish is, is uh, altered in many ways. Uh, the sound perception, the uh, avoidance of a predator, which is affected. There are many areas of, uh, of uh, marine life which are affected by ocean acidification. If I could have a further comment on how this links to warm water corals and coral bleaching, and although bleaching is caused by the high temperatures, but the recovery after that bleaching event, the corals then take several years, the reef might take several years to grow back again. If, if there's ocean acidification, the growth is a lot slower, so recovery might have been possible within five or ten years, but with under ocean acidification conditions, the recovery might take ten or fifteen years. Now, if during that time period there's a further bleaching event, then the coral doesn't have enough time to recover in time before, and then that's, it happens very rapidly. But already, that the Great Barrier Reef and many other warm water coral reefs are at very high risk, and that's at around one degrees warming without going to 1.5 degrees or two degrees warming. It isn't just the warm water corals, that there are corals deeper in the ocean that don't require the, the, the plants for photosynthesis, but they are being affected by it, they're being eroded, their growth is being slowed as well. They're called cold water corals, they occur around the UK, they occur around Norway as well, New Zealand, many other parts of the world, uh, but we're now finding that their, their growth is slowing down uh, and they're becoming much more brittle and fragile. Now, some corals might be able to survive, it's not saying that all will become extinct in 20 years' time, but be very depleted and be very different, unfortunately, in the future. May I add something? Uh, Warm, warm coral also provide ecosystem services to the human beings and uh, for example in the tropical areas they provide coastal protection uh, they, they are uh, providing them food with fisheries and also tourism and uh, for example tourism for certain countries are the only way to have foreign currencies to be able then to buy the imports needed for their for their uh, survival thank you for those replies um there is a very interesting question brought by melissa captcha um how is uh, how civil society can put pressure to our governments especially in developing countries to follow the recommendation you made in this scientific report Well, um, we are here to um, provide, uh, you know, uh, to 
explain what this report is about, explain the main findings. Uh, the IPCC doesn't dwell on two politics, so it's not all as uh, here, I think, in this, uh, in this uh, presentation to uh, address uh, this kind of question. I would like just to say that, uh, you know, the, the youth uh, movement of the past uh, weeks, uh, I think, is a way to um, uh, alert uh, decision makers, and there are many other ways, uh, you know, elections and things like that. Uh, so, I don't have a, a specific recipe uh, for uh, the person who asked the question, and it's very difficult for us to venture into uh, pol the political ar arena. Yeah. Yes, I agree, I agree with Jean-Pierre. We are not here to to be policy prescriptive. We, we give uh, some options and then the government should decide. But uh, one possibility what you speak about to developing countries is uh, that the Paris Agreement has a financial mechanism uh, that will uh, give the, those countries means to, to uh, achieve their goals. So maybe the civil society and uh, the, the firms, uh, industry can put pressure on the government to have this money and uh, to do for, recon for their uh, uh, energy transition, their uh, diversification, etc. I would like to support the comments from my colleagues in that uh, scientists provide the information and evidence, but it is up to the policy to make the decisions. But nevertheless, we did give uh, consideration last Friday whether or not those at the meeting uh, how we could whether we should join the global strike for climate whether it would, would be helpful or not we decided that if we lost a day then we probably wouldn't finish the report and that actually wouldn't be to anyone's benefit so we carried on working but as individuals we expressed our our support uh, and our, uh, our sympathy and our uh, encouragement as far as it was possible for the, the wider awareness of climate, as indicated by uh, many young people around the world, whether it was millions who, who did make the effort, who did go to a lot of trouble to show that they cared and that we wish to give our support. But as scientists, I think we have to have the, and we're we going to carry out communication, we do our best, but then the point when we hand it over to, to the governments of the world. Yes. Um, all right, so taking you on a different angle, we have a question that says, any model software for carbon sequestration in the ocean that you would suggest or have knowledge about? Could you, could you repeat the question about what uh, yeah. carbon sequestration, um, what, what particular way? It's basically any models of soft sequestration in the ocean that you would suggest or have knowledge about. So it might be someone who's uh, more interested in the research part. Um, Maybe um, do you mean uh, blue carbon? Do you mean blue carbon, for example? It is in this question. It's uh, carbon sequestration, but um, I think it's safe if you go for blue carbons. Just has a matter. I will. Um, Phil, we cannot hear you very well. Uh, I've now got the microphone back again. Right. Uh, some further comments about blue carbon in that there's, there's no doubt that mangroves and seagrass and salt marshes have a lot of carbon in their sediments and that, that they do have a, on a, on a per unit area basis, a lot of carbon is stored there. Now, when it comes to increasing the amount of, of carbon uh, in that system, we've got to be careful in that it's not very easy to measure it. And if one has a, a restoration project, you've got to be aware that yes, there's some carbon going in, there might be methane coming out. You might be having other changes to the system. It's not, it's not straightforward. Now, some places it's successful, it can be done, but we can't go back 200 years to the state of 
of all these systems being in their in their pristine natural conditions it's just not possible because in the meanwhile we've, we've built along the coast we've got uh, various developments now we do something and the the balance is is getting as much as possible for the conservation to doing the restoration where it is economical to do so but don't rely on that to to save uh, the world for, from 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 the from the, the climate change problem for that we have to reduce emissions we've got to, to reduce emissions reduce emissions get to net zero for emissions and then one can think about if there's a little bit left over having the balance between getting to net zero by having some emissions and having some additional uptake but that's only the last part of the problem the main problem and the main solutions is still that we're adding to the atmosphere by carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Maybe I fully agree with uh, with Phil, uh, and maybe I can add uh, that uh, salt marshes, mangroves, and uh, seagrass beds, uh, which uh, Phil has mentioned, are uh, not only uh, good. Yes. Uh, respect to gigantic. There are many reasons uh, for also for conserving and restoring uh, those ecosystems because they provide uh, many benefits uh, to humans. They protect uh, the coast uh, from uh, the erosion from waves and uh, and uh, swells. Uh, they also uh, host a lot of uh, diversity. So they, Conserving those systems is also a way to conserve biodiversity. There are many species that uh, reproduce uh, in those systems, uh, so it also it's also important for food security. Uh, so for all those reasons, uh, even though the effectiveness uh, in terms of CO2 uptake is uh, relatively modest, there is a there are many reasons to conserve and preserve seagrass beds, mangroves, and salt marshes. Well, uh, thank you for those great uh, answers. We have so many questions, but unfortunately, uh, the time is running out. So uh, we'll start uh, to conclude uh, at the moment. Um, so first of all, I would like to ask um, you three that know very well this report, what could you tell uh, in a short sentence to the people that are watching um, about this report? Uh, either recommendations or something they should really keep in mind. It is very important to realize this report uh, uh, looks at two scenarios. A fossil fuel in intensive scenarios with high uh, CO2 emissions and one scenario with, which is low uh, emissions compatible with the Paris Agreement. Uh, the situation is quite bleak with the high emission scenario, but with the low emission scenario, again, uh, compatible with the Paris Agreement, it, it, there is a way to uh, stabilize uh, ocean acidification and warming and to moderate uh, other aspects. So it is critically important. Uh, that's, um, in, in my view, the main message is that to save the ocean and the cryosphere, sticking to uh, the uh, Paris Agreement is the best way to go. Phil or Natalie? Okay. Uh, what I would say to people is to educate themselves, to understand the phenomena, to know why they need to reduce their CO2 emissions and other, other uh, uh, gases because uh, they, 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 they are polluting the planet and they don't understand uh, that it is really urgent to do something, to take action. I think this is the most important thing. And to understand why we do something, we have to, to read the report and to try to pick in, in this report what will uh, impact our everyday lives. My comments, and I'll, I'll agree with what's just been said, and we, we, we're all in agreement on those, but for me, the report really brought together the connections of the Earth system. And to begin with, when we started two years ago, I thought high mountains, polar regions, oceans, you know, it's a little bit separate. But the report did bring them all together, did show the connections, and did show that those systems are really the ones that, that drive and control the, the, 
the, the conditions on Earth. And although we've emphasized sea level rise in coastal regions, one of the features of, of the meeting was how many countries in Monaco last week, they said, well, we're an inland country, but our weather comes from the sea, that uh, a cyclone might do most of the damage on the coast, but then it comes inland and it, it affects our weather. We might have floods or droughts, and that weather system originated in the South Atlantic or the Indian Ocean. So even if you're in the mountains of Zimbabwe, your weather comes from the coast. And that's true everywhere in the world because that's the way the climate system operates. And it, the time scales that are important for time climate are on the 10, 20, 50, 100 years. And once and the climate system is, is dynamic, it, ha it changes of its own accord, but now we're giving it a big push in one direction and we're now observing what is happening. And these things have happened before when we haven't been involved in it, but then other people uh, have recorded the consequences in the paleo climate. Now we're seeing that it's happening now, it's happening to us today. Thank you so much for these um, great uh, comments. I hope um, you uh, watching from all around the world uh, have understood uh, how special this moment has been in history because for the first time such report is produced and we're really hoping that it's going to have an impact, especially in December in the COP25. So uh, we are encouraging you, all of you to share your insights about this session on Twitter or on Facebook and uh, using obviously the hashtag uh, virtual blue cup 25 and uh, you can find more information of today's speakers on their website this uh, virtual event will be available shortly so don't worry um, if you have missed something and um, we will have also different uh, virtual events coming up in the following months before and during the cup so the topics are really ranging from uh, free divers shark specialists youth of Fridays for Future movement, reducing emissions in the scientific world, and so on. Um, but to follow these awesome events, you really need to subscribe either to our mailing list or the YouTube channel. And uh, before showing uh, the image in the screen, I would really uh, like to thank once again Jean-Pierre Gattuso, Nathalie Hilmi, Philip Williamson. Thank you to the audience all around the world. And uh, just look at the picture one in one little moment. Thank you.